Well, this morning we return again to the Gospel of Matthew and to the Beatitudes. Last time we noted of the title that this is a collection of sayings, and this collection that we understand to be the Beatitudes is taken from the Latin word beatus, which is the word for blessed. And these Beatitudes function as an introduction to Jesus' famous Sermon on the Mount, a sermon that begins by spelling out the very different view that we might have of Christianity than what is currently popular. In a sense, each of these Beatitudes is counterintuitive to popular Christianity. We are often told that God will bless us with power and with victory and strength, but then Jesus declares, blessed are the poor in spirit. Some have claimed that God wants you to be happy and healthy and prosperous. But Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn. The mainstream will tell you that it's it's being a good Christian means being winsome and lighthearted in such a way that everybody's going to like you and want to be your friend and want to hear about Jesus. But Jesus himself says, blessed are those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness. And so with Jesus, we see very quickly that up is down. Things are not always what they seem with God. Because God sees things very differently than we do. Now, it's not that he is against joy and kindness or victory. Not at all. But rather, it's that he sees the value of humility and even sadness and persecution in a way that we just don't. In our studying of the Word of God, our task is to see these things the way that God does. We want to have spiritual eyesight. I want to understand the mind of God to understand His precepts. And as we see all of life through His eyes, we can better than conform our minds toward loving and obeying His precepts. And so today we're going to look just at how the Lord Jesus Christ views mourning and sadness. And so turn with me to Matthew chapter 5 in your Bible. Matthew chapter 5. Last time we examined the context for the Beatitudes, and we explored the first one that comes to us in verse 3, blessed are the poor in spirit. But we also noted that in the introduction, it's the importance of understanding to whom Jesus is speaking. Who is he talking to? And certainly he is teaching publicly before the crowds, he's in front of thousands of people giving this teaching, the audience, the intended audience, is most certainly his disciples. And so look with me at Matthew chapter 5. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain. And after he sat down, his disciples came to him. He opened his mouth and began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now we noted last time that each of these eight Beatitudes begins with the Greek word makarios, which means happy or blissful or favored. Now, this is not a generic happiness that's divorced from everything else. It's a happy, a happy blessing that is directly connected to the person of God. In fact, when New Testament scholar Grant Osborne translates this in his commentary, he renders the phrase grammatically, God blesses. God blesses the poor in spirit. God blesses those who are meek. God blesses those who mourn. I believe that's correct. And so Jesus' pronouncement of blessed implies a blessing that comes from God. Again, we don't receive these blessings 
just inherently by ourselves or in and of themselves, there is a connection directly tied to God. Again, these are blessings for Christian believers. Firstly, because the Sermon on the Mount is directed to Christian believers. And secondly, apart from the provision of God, in the midst of all these realities, there is no blessing. What do I mean, what do I mean by that? Well, you tell an unconverted person that they're happy if they're poor, sad, hungry, or persecuted, then look, they'll look at you like you have seven heads. Because there's no inherent value in and of itself to being poor. There's no inherent value in being sad. All things considered. There's no inherent blessing in any of these things, not even in the positive ones. To seek righteousness, to seek mercy, purity, peace, and yet reject Christ is not to be blessed, but to be cursed. And we see this in Jesus is dealing with the Pharisees because the Pharisees, they sought all of those positive things, yet they did it without Christ, and he cursed them because of their self-righteousness and their false piety and their false humility. And so we have to see all of these things with spiritual, regenerate eyesight, especially when it comes to the difficult ones, like today's. Blessed are those who mourn. Let's examine this together. Grief and sadness are experiences that are common to all people. All people. In fact, a life without sorrow and mourning is impossible, as mourning comes because of the fall, because of sin, whether it be in sickness or in death or sinfulness or loss or injustice or malice or even quarreling. All of these things are directly tied to the tear in the created order that is caused by the entrance of sin. We read in Romans 5.12, just as through one man, talking about Adam, sin entered into the world and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. And so the sin of Adam ushered in all of this. It's It's this little tiny tear, it's actually a big tear, but ripped open the entire cosmos and ushered in all of this Pandora's box of sin and wickedness and pain and suffering. And along with all this pain and suffering and death comes mourning. Mourning. Romans 8.21 tells us that the fall has corrupted even the creation Verse 22, the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth. If you've ever witnessed or experienced childbirth, and all the mothers watching and here have experienced the pains of childbirth, you know what kind of an experience that is. And that is the experience that is likened to the creation suffering and groaning and in pain and traversing in the midst of the curse of the fall. And so sin has caused inconceivable damage that causes humans to mourn and the creation to groan. But here, verse 4, what is this mourning that he's talking about? The root word here is pentheo in the Greek. It refers to lament. It means to grieve or to bewail. Scholar William Mounts notes that this word is used in context of mourning over disasters and grieving the loss of someone. And so this is not just a general sadness or melancholy. This is a deep, overwhelming lament over inconceivable loss. If I could editorialize, this is to be overtaken by grief and sorrow. But again, what is the context? What is the context of this? If the Sermon on the Mount is addressed to believers, then those who mourn are specifically believers who mourn. Well, another question then is, well, okay, over what are we mourning? What are we mourning? Now, certainly this could refer to many kinds of mourning, but Bible scholars lean toward one of two main options here, if you look at the context. Some have suggested that this mourning is referring to what Jesus is talking about in the weeping and mourning over poverty and even persecution, which is experienced in verses 10 through 12. 
When Jesus says in verse 10, Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So you have persecution. Verse uh, 11, Blessed are those when people uh, insult you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely because of me. He says, Rejoice and be glad for your reward in heaven is great because they persecuted the prophets just like this. And so he's referring here to persecution. He's referring to being insulted, being uh, spoken evil of, slandered. And so again, one view is that these people are mourning over the experience of all these things, and that certainly could be true. He describes the reality of those who are suffering, and they are experiencing profound sadness because of this. However, a far more convincing argument, another notion, is that this is pertaining to those who mourn over their own sins. We see this kind of mourning heavily through the scriptures and specifically in the psalms of penitence and lament. Psalm 32, when I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. Psalm 38, there is no health in my sins. My iniquities are gone over my head. My wounds grow foul and fester because of my folly. Again, it's on him. I am bent over and greatly bowed down. I go mourning all day long. The psalmist notes in Psalm 119.136, My eyes shed streams of water because they do not keep your law. This is a deep mourning, a lament over sinful rebellion in the heart. A stubborn willfulness against God that invariably turns the regenerated person inward and they begin to weep and wail and lament because they don't have righteousness, because they don't obey God, because they transgress His law. And that's a common experience for all of us as believers. When unbelievers are caught in sin, they might feel bad that they got caught. They might feel bad about the effects. But a Christian, one who has been born again, feels the deep sense of sadness and loss and disappointment and travail because of the affront to the holiness of God that our sin causes. And so we are intimately acquainted with true mourning over sinfulness. And let me tell you, this is right This is actually good. We should mourn over our sins because God hates them. God hates the sinfulness that is inherent in me. And they are the only thing that's standing between humans and our God is this sinfulness. And so part of genuine repentance is a sorrow and a mourning over sin. In fact, I would even add that if there is no sorrow over your sinfulness, I would argue that you have no repentance. No repentance if there's no sorrow over sin. And without repentance, there is no salvation. Because how can you be saved from your sins if you don't even see the need for a Savior? Saved from my sins? Why? No, your soul the Bible says, must become broken and contrite to the point where you lament your own condition. In fact, Paul rebukes the Corinthian church for this very thing in 1 Corinthians 5.2, saying to the church, you have become arrogant because you've not mourned instead with regards to their lackadaisical attitude towards sin in the church. We read the same thing from James in James chapter 4, verse 7. He tells them, Submit therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Then he says, Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Then he says this, Be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord, and He will exalt you. In other words, blessed are those who are poor in spirit. You see the connection? So this is right for us to mourn our own sinfulness. Even more sharply than James, by the way, Jesus says in Luke 6.25, He warns against those who don't mourn. He says, Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn 
and weep. In short, Jesus is saying, if you don't mourn your sins now, you will mourn your sins forever in the judgment. Well, the question then is, well, what of the faithful believers who do mourn over their sins? Who do mourn over the evils of the world that we see? Who do mourn over all the things that would break God's heart? What about us who do mourn and weep and lament? Jesus says, You are blessed. You are blessed. Why? Why does He bless those who mourn? And He says, You're blessed because you will be comforted. Look at the next portion of this verse. You will be comforted. The Greek word he used here is parakaleo, which means to come alongside. More specifically, this is the express purpose of coming alongside to build up and to encourage. Whereas sin and sorrow debilitates and weakens a person, Christ is actually promising comfort and strength. I want to direct your attention to the nature of of this statement in Matthew 5, 4. He says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. This word shall is the same as will. They will be comforted. This is not an idle promise. Don't take this lightly. See, when you and I offer comfort to someone who is hurting, our comfort only goes so far. If I say to a person who's hurting, Hang in there. Tomorrow's going to be a better day. I can't promise that. I don't know what's coming. For all I know, tomorrow might actually be worse for them. They might suffer greater loss. Ever have a bad day? And you think, man, how could this day possibly get any worse? And the music comes in, dun, dun, dun. And it gets worse. What do you do? What do you say to a person who that is happening to them? And I've known people who've had a really bad life. 10 years, 20 years, 30 years of suffering and pain and loss and mourning. Let me tell you, they will not be comforted by my idle words. As well-intentioned as I personally might be, my well-wishing is only going to go so far for them. The first funeral I ever did was for a family who lost their three-month-old baby. The mother was rocking the baby to sleep. Mom fell asleep, and when she woke up, the baby was gone. There's no rhyme or reason for it. She didn't do anything wrong. The doctors simply deemed it sudden infant death syndrome. What do you say to a mother who loses a baby like that? The answer is... As for me, nothing. There is nothing that I can say to bring true comfort. I don't have the spiritual resources. I don't have the omnipotent power to grant comfort. I can't change a heart and bring healing. I have nothing to offer in and of myself. So the question persists then, then what do you offer? You offer them the comfort of Jesus Christ. Turn to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians is a letter that deals with Christian ministry. Paul's first letter to the church in Corinth, if you remember, was very difficult. It was a a hard letter, as he calls it, as he rebukes them for their many sins. But in 2 Corinthians... He brings a message to them that is a message of comfort. And he ministers to them with the love of Christ. I want you to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God which is at Corinth, with all the saints who are throughout Achaia, grace to you and peace from God our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort, 
who comforts us in our in all our affliction so that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God for just as the sufferings of Christ are ours in abundance so also our comfort is abundant through Christ but if we are afflicted it is for your comfort and salvation or if we are comforted it is for your comfort which is effective in the patient enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer and our hope for you is firmly grounded knowing that as you are sharers of our sufferings you also are sharers of our comfort i want you to notice the main focus of verses 3 through 7 it's the word comfort it's used here 10 times in just a few verses 10 times Elsewhere Paul actually expounds on the theme in many other places nine other times in 2 Corinthians alone does he bring up this word comfort so it's a pervasive theme in 2 Corinthians but here if you look at it he connects this theme of comfort to its true origin which is God look at verse 3 again he calls God the father of mercies and the god of all comfort. I want you to notice the word all. All comfort. Meaning there's no amount of needed comfort that can't be found in the person of God. All comfort. In verse 4, it's God who comforts us in all our affliction. I've been battling with sickness. God can bring comfort. Battling the loss of a family member. A parent, a child, a spouse, the God of all comfort. Loss of job or financial stability, or my home, or my possessions, or relationships, or freedoms, or whatever you lose, whatever you're in need of comfort for, God is the God of all comfort who grants comfort in all our affliction. So Paul here ties all true comfort to God the Father. And then in verse 5, we see him further connect this comfort to us through Jesus Christ. Now we see that because of our union with Christ, we suffer with him. If you're, if you're a believer, if you're a Christian, you are in Christ. You are inextricably connected to him. You cannot be separated from him. You are in Christ. And so therefore, the sufferings and the turmoil and the persecution of Christ is also yours as well. So if they persecuted him, what are they going to do to us? So our sufferings are Christ's sufferings. But we also see that because of our union with Christ, our comfort is also abundant through Christ. And so we have comfort because of our union with Christ. What about the Holy Spirit? Well, Paul doesn't mention him specifically here. But Jesus does in John 14, 16. Jesus refers to the Holy Spirit as the parakletos. Same Greek word from Matthew 5, 4. Many translators render this the helper. It's the same Greek word that's used in 1 Corinthians, excuse me, 2 Corinthians 1. All these words for comfort. Matthew 5, 4. Literally, it's comforter. Comforter. So our comfort as believers is rooted in the ministry of the triune God. God Himself as the Father is the owner, originator, and dispenser of comfort. Christ is the mediator of our comfort. It's through Him. And the Holy Spirit is Himself the minister of comfort to all of God's people. So when you're talking about drawing comfort from a well, the well is God. He is where our comfort can be found. And then He says... It's with the comfort that we receive from God. Paul says we are able to comfort those who are in any affliction. We get to take what we've received from God and give it to other people. My friends, the body of Christ has more than enough comfort and strength and love to give to people outside of this church. We have answers and we have comfort that the world does not know. We have it because of our connection with God. 
because He is the wellspring of such comfort. What does it mean to comfort others with the comfort of Christ? It means that you're able to listen to them, to hold them up, to weep with them, to serve them, to give to them, to encourage them. All the while, you're ministering to them gospel promises. It's not just helping for the sake of helping. You're ministering with a message. Promises that God is sovereign, righteous, holy, and merciful. That although our sins are great, Christ is greater. And Christ gave Himself as a ransom to pay for sins and to conquer the grave. That in Christ there is therefore now no guilt, no shame, no punishment, and no condemnation. That because of new life in Christ, we will one day be with Him in glory. New body, glorified mind, new creation, a whole redeemed humanity. So let me encourage you with this. If you're in Christ, you're living your worst life now. It only gets better in Christ. He says, blessed are those who mourn in this life because they shall be comforted for eternity. That's the implication. Elsewhere in John 16.20, Jesus says virtually the same thing. Truly, truly, I say to you that you will weep and lament and the world will rejoice And you will be sorrowful, but then he says, your sorrow will be turned into joy. The world is not going to have the last laugh. Satan is not going to have the last laugh. Even though you suffer now, and you might be in pain now, and you mourn now, he will turn, he will transform your weeping and your sorrow and your lament into joy. This is prophesied in the Old Testament. This has always been the mission. Isaiah 61 testifies that at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, He would bring good news to the afflicted. He would bind up the brokenhearted. Proclaim liberty to the captives. Freedom to prisoners. He would proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And what else? Comfort all who mourn. So our comfort comes in the person of Christ. And let me just say, there is a linguistic connection between the word favorable and the word blessed. And so in Christ's first sermon, He he proclaims a, a blessed favor. And He offers that comfort and mercy and peace and satisfaction. He offers the exact same blessings that He's promised to us beforehand. All the things promised in Isaiah 61, he brings with him. But this is more than personal. This is eschatological. It's not just comfort for us right now who hold on to the hope. It's a promise for a glorious future. God will bring comfort to you in your situation, in your heart. He can grant comfort and strength to you right now. But however far that goes for you, the promise is declared by God. He will bring comfort for eternity. When Christ declared that mourners will be comforted, He's looking forward to the day of the Lord, of His return, when every single wrong would be righted. And every pain alleviated. And every wound mended. And every longing satisfied. In fact, we even read about this. Those who are alive at the end, in Revelation chapter 7, said to me, these are the ones who come out of the great tribulation, and they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. For this reason, they are before the throne of God, and they serve Him day and night in His temple. And He who sits on the throne will spread His tabernacle over them. Listen to this. Revelation 7. They will hunger no longer, nor thirst any more, nor will the sun beat down on them or any heat. 
For the Lamb in the center of the throne will be their shepherd and will guide them to springs of the water of life and God will wipe every tear from their eyes. He is promising a comfort and a restoration that nobody in this lifetime could ever imagine. This is a blessed hope, a blessed promise. No more hunger, no more thirst, no more exhaustion. He will rescue. He will redeem. He will wipe every tear away from every eye. My friends, this is real comfort. This is true comfort. That Jesus Christ is Lord and He's coming again. And He will bring all of this with Him when He comes. I love what the Heidelberg Catechism expresses. The very beginning of the Catechism. What is your only comfort in life and death? That I am not my own, but belong with body and soul, both in life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with His precious blood and has set me free from all the power of the devil. He also preserves me in such a way that without the will of my heavenly Father, not a hair can fall from my head. Indeed, all things must work together for my salvation. Therefore, by His Holy Spirit, He also assures me of eternal life and makes me heartily willing and ready from now on to live for Him. Have you mourned the loss of a dear loved one? Are you struggling with difficulties and challenges? Do you hate your sinfulness and lament evil and long for righteousness? Are you in need of such comfort? Then encourage your heart in Christ. He can forgive your sins. He can heal your wounds. He can build you up and refresh your spirit. And my friends, He can give you joy. He is the God of all comfort. I want to close with the testimony of Cotton Mather. Cotton Mather was born in 1663 in Boston, Massachusetts, where he eventually became a pastor. He ministered faithfully there for more than 40 years until his death in 1728. And the reason I'm focusing on Mather is because during his lifetime, he experienced a large number of trials and losses. In his lifetime, Mather lost two wives as well as 13 of 15 children. At the end of his life, he struggled financially. And in addition to all of that, if all that wasn't bad enough, in his lifetime, he suffered slanderous attacks against him. But yet he clung to Christ. And in the account of his death, we read this. Through 1724 and 1725, Cotton began suffering long bouts of sickness. Sensing his end, his thoughts became transfixed on the Lord. And after a long winter sickness, he uttered these words, Now I have nothing more to do here. My will is entirely swallowed up in the will of the Lord. On February 13, 1728, Cotton Mather died peacefully in his home at the age of 65. On his deathbed, he said, Is this dying? Is this all? Is this all that I feared when I prayed against a hard death? Oh, I can bear this, he said. I can bear it. I can bear it. And his wife, Lydia, wiped his eyes, to which he replied, I am going where all tears will be wiped from my eyes. And then he passed on. My friends, encourage your heart. Blessed are those who mourn in this life. 
for they shall be comforted. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we appeal to you because you are the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. And God, it is so easy for us our knee-jerk reaction, our stubborn will, our bent is to rush headlong into fear and doubt and lament and crying and wailing and suffering our own condition. And God, I am the chief of sinners. But Lord God, You also promise that You will comfort those who are afflicted and those who mourn. You entreat us to come to You, all You who are weary and heavy laden. And You've promised to give rest. You tell us to take up Your yoke to follow You because You are gentle and humble at heart. God, You have promised rest. You've promised comfort. You've promised healing. Rest for our souls. And so God, in the midst of a pandemic, in the midst of personal trials, Lord, a congregation that is struggling with health problems, and in some cases financial concerns and problems, and isolation and loneliness, and fear and doubt, anxiety and worry, And Father, even depression and anxiety that goes even deeper. In the midst of all our travailing against the the wicked evils of this world, Lord, it is so easy for us to mourn. We mourn even being apart from one another, even right now. But God, we know that we are resting in the palm of Your hand. That You are the God of all comfort. And God, if this isolation, if this crisis is what you will use to break our legs underneath us and force us to rely on you and trust in you and seek our comfort only in you, then complete your work. Help us, Lord, to draw all of our nourishment from the well that is found only in you. We appeal to you, God, that yes, our sins are great, but the God of all comfort is greater. And so we come to you in the name of Jesus. Amen.